It's often exciting to look to the future of UNO, what it might be like in times to come. Sometimes, though, it's important to stop. Stop and take a good look at the past of the university, the people and the happenings that help make the excitement of future history possible. With this in mind, join for Reflections in Time. and interesting and sometimes exciting to look at the past of things like our University of Nebraska at Omaha and University of Omaha as we've known it in years gone by. But with this particular segment of videotape, we try to go into the past and talk to people in the present who've lived through a lot of life and also a lot of time with the University of Nebraska at Omaha and of course often with the University of Omaha. And that's the kind of person who's with me in this particular recording in the summer of 1982. He's Don Flaster, my friend and colleague for some 20, 25 to 30 years. Don's retired now, but he spent lots of years at the university, not only as a teacher, a coach, a, well, he'll tell us about all the various jobs he had, but he was there in the 30s, as I recall, as a student. Don, I'm glad you could sit down and chat with me today. What is your first memory of any sort of the University of Omaha? Where did it happen? Yeah. When did it happen? What? Well, I think, Paul, I, I recall, I had the rare experience of being at both the old university out on North 24th yeah. Street, 24th and Pratt, and the new university, as we call it then, that we moved out there in 1938. But uh, I, uh, I recall the, the old university is, uh, the facilities we had were quite limited. What was it like up on North 24th there? Oh, it was, uh, we had, we had one, we really had more buildings than we had out at the, uh, when we moved out on Dodge. Were, we they, about, were they all in one place or were they spread around? No, we had about three buildings on the campus. There was a li I well, laughingly, a library. It was a, a kind of a Quonset hut. Yeah. And uh, it was a wooden building. And then they had the administration building. And then they had a, a hall they called Jocelyn Hall. Yeah. And that was used as an auditorium and a gym. But it wasn't legal size, although we played basketball games on there. It was a little small? It was small. And they had a balcony over it, and uh, the opposition, uh, it took them a while to adjust to that balcony. <laughs> but they were going in for layups. And a that. little bit hard yeah. to handle. But uh, I, uh, I uh, recall that we also had uh, uh, a building. They condemned a grade school. Uh, Saratoga Grade School yeah. at 24th and Ames. They condemned the grade school. and. Uh, the university took over it as a science hall, and that was also where our athletic uh, uh, locker room was. I was talking to a fellow the other night. He talked about that building. Yeah. He'd go over there for a class or so. Right. And yeah. uh, the FIAD and that sort of stuff was there, huh? Yes. Uh, right across from the car barn, wasn't it? That's right. For the street and, car. Uh, there were some of the athletes uh, that stayed over the, uh, uh, the they had a, uh, well, I guess it was a post office down below, and up above they had apartments, and some of the athletes stayed there. They served horrible food. They fixed it themselves. <laughs> I ate there several times, and uh, uh, it was uh, edible, but just barely. Now, you were a North Omaha boy, so the university was really almost at home, wasn't it? Right. I, uh, I graduated from North High in uh, 1936, and then I attended Creighton for a year, and then I came back to uh, the old Omaha U in 37. Now, uh, in those early years of your life in at North High School and on into to Creighton and then the University of Omaha, you were always interested in sports, weren't you? Yes, I was. Uh, Where'd that start and why did it start? Do you have any idea? Well, I played uh, in the, at North High. I, I played basketball. And I was fortunate enough to make All-State a couple of years and I played football. And that was the reason I quit Creighton is because uh, they had me there on a basketball scholarship and I, I preferred uh, to play uh, football also. Uh -huh. And so uh, I thought that since I wanted to go out and teach and coach that uh, uh, that I would, uh, you know, prefer to uh, get a little experience in, in football. And, uh, but the athletics has changed considerably uh, from today out at the university and when I was there. Yeah, when you were playing football, and I just picture this in my mind as a boy, to see people in football uniforms, the equipment was really different, wasn't yes, it? Yes, oh, the equipment was... Uh, 
We had different kinds of helmets, as I remember. Pretty soft, you, weren't they? Well, they were soft and not all the same. It looked, uh, <laughs> uh, well, some of the, the uh, movies that I've seen that they took then, uh, it looks like long, hardy movies, really. <laughs> uh, we weren't, uh, well, I will say this, and in, in defense of all those fellows that played at that time, we were pretty well schooled, though, in fundamentals, tackling and blocking that. But uh, our team was not near the caliber. We we didn't have the numbers. Uh, How many men did you have out for football? Oh, there was, uh, if, we got, if we got uh, 20, when we'd go on a trip and we could take 25 men, we felt we were pretty well fortified. But, of course, everybody played all the time, didn't they, offense right. and defense? That's right. They. Uh, uh, we didn't have, in those days, we didn't have specialists, uh, no. you know, somebody come in and do the kick and there's somebody doing uh, so the end runs or whatever. Yeah. You, you played yeah. both ways. Yeah. You played both ways. But the facilities were bad. Uh, the practice facilities, uh, we were kind of a no-man group. Uh, we even practiced over at Exarbon. And uh, I think uh, I probably said this before, but uh, uh, they had... Uh, polos, uh, ponies over there, you know, they played polo, and we had to wait to get on the field to, after they, George Brandeis and some of those people got off. Wait know. a minute, they had a polo field over there? Never a, heard of that. Yeah, they had a polo field, it was right on, Where the uh, racetrack is now, maybe? No, it was towards Center Street. Yeah? Towards Center Street, and uh, uh, it was, they had pretty good tour, turf, it got a lot of uh, fertilization, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, we played... Uh, We'd play there. I, it's a wonder we all didn't catch pneumonia. We went over there in a truck, an open truck. An open truck. And that sometimes it would be a little bit cold, <laughs> and you would be sweaty, and you'd jump on that truck and, and, and ride back to the university. This was uh, when we were out on Dodge now. I'm yeah, talking about. yeah. But uh, it's, uh, if you missed the truck, then you had the opportunity to uh, run. And, <laughs> Yeah, that's why we never had anybody stay after practice and practice. They made the truck. Thing. We didn't, <laughs> didn't want to miss the truck. Another, th another thing I think that uh, I remember that's quite a bit different is uh, the uh, the scholarship program. We didn't have uh, well, they gave citizenship grants. Yeah. What they called. What What were they like? Well, I think they paid. Uh, I got a half citizenship grant. I think that paid me seventy five dollars. For the year. Yeah. What did school cost in those well, days? About three dollars an hour. Yeah. About three dollars an hour. Any was, fees for labs or student activities uh, or things like that? No, nah, very limited. Uh, we, I think that uh, actually for uh, sixty dollars a semester, you that included everything: your books and your uh, the fees and your tuition and and all that. Well, then seventy-five dollars would yeah. take care yeah. of one wasn't semester too, for wasn't you at too least. Bad. Wasn't yeah. Too bad. Yeah. But there weren't really scholarships in the sense that we know them no. today for athletes. No. I think there's something illegal about them, they thought. Now, who were, do you recall some of the people, uh, some of whom might still be around with us in various ways, uh, who played with you in those days? Yeah. Well, I think uh, mm. probably uh, Bob Matthews, or oh, yeah. people will remember him. He's in the Hall of Fame out there at, right. uh, at the university. Uh, he was uh, a good ball player. Uh, we had... Uh, we had a lot of farm boys from over in Iowa, uh, Clarence McDermott and Carl Dankoff and uh, Paul Gear, a personal friend of mine oh, from yeah. Harlan, Iowa. I know Paul. Yeah, and uh, we, uh, we, we put on a pretty uh, representative team. A lot of people don't realize that, uh, you know, there was some talk when the university now got back in the North Central. Well, we were in the North Central. That's at that right. Time. What? Uh, yeah, at the time you were yeah. in school, you were there, weren't you? We were in the North Central yeah. Conference, and we were quite competitive. Of course, in those days, uh, they played a different brand of football. Everybody did. It wasn't as wide open as it is now. It wasn't as interesting to watch. Pretty much hit the line and oh, punt. Oh yeah, huh? yeah. It was. Uh, they a lot uh, of head knocking, though. Oh yeah. They weren't. Uh, we didn't weren't too uh, tricky. I think they'd scout us about every third year, <laughs> and uh, to see what we had, but. Uh, <laughs> It was, uh, it was, it was, uh, we had a lot of fun. Uh, Who were the schools in that? In the, what were the schools in the North Central It was pretty much land? the same as now, same? except, uh, well, there was uh, the North Dakota schools. Yeah. Uh, North Dakota U, North Dakota State, South Dakota U, South Dakota State, Morningside, and uh, Omaha, and then the Iowa State, Iowa Teachers. That was at Cedar Falls. They've changed their name now. Yeah, Northern Iowa. Yeah, and now they've got who? Uh, they have... Uh, is Mankato in there now? Yes, Mankato. just coming in in this year of 82. Yeah. And St. Cloud. Yeah, okay. Now, right. uh, but uh, 
We, uh, we had uh, this much difficulty beating North Dakota then as they have now yeah. in basketball. But uh, we ended, I think one year we were second place in the conference in basketball. Well, I imagine some of those schools were getting into the scholarship programs more yeah. than we were as a University well, of Omaha, right? Yeah, we, uh, towards the, right before the war, uh, things begin to open up a little bit. But uh, I don't know why they get out of the North Central, maybe partly because of financial reasons. Yeah. You know, the travel and yeah. this, and uh, we didn't have big attendance at those games, you know. And not much income of any sort. No, no, there was very little income from the gate. You know, they tell that story, and I want to say that that's not true about <laughs> the guy calling up, you know, and say, what time does the game start? And they answered, well, what time can you get here? <laughs> now, that wasn't true, <laughs> but they keep telling that story. But, but it was uh, almost that bad, huh? Well, you didn't have to get there early. No. Uh, no you could come in and uh, find a seat. But you know, uh, down playing, that hard rock'em sock'em game in those days with not good equipment and not for much in the way of scholarship help to go to college, you know, what was a person's motivation yeah. to play? You yeah. really liked to play, didn't you? Yeah, that was, uh, that's true. You uh, had to love the game. And uh, it was, uh, well, you know, even as late as when I was, uh, you know, I started out there as staff member in 46, and yeah. I was coaching. Uh, I was head basketball in, court in 48, and we didn't even have a, practice, a place to practice. We had to go down to Tech High and practice at night, yeah. and we had no scholarships then, no scholarships. And those kids, they had to spend their own car fare money and uh, to get down there and practice late at night. And uh, it was uh, it's a wonder we could field a team, yeah. but we did, and we had some good teams. Uh, I recall... Uh, my first game that we played against was with Iowa University oh. in basketball. And uh, we went over there and didn't do too poorly either. Well, you, we took a little jump here, and we'll come back to that again. Your years, uh, you, when you first came to the university as such as a, as a member of the staff. But now, you're back at college, and uh, you came to UNO, or University of Omaha, of course, and finished out your program there. Then, uh, after you got your degree, you said earlier, you wanted to coach and do things like that. What did you do uh, when you first graduated, Don? Well, when I got out of school in 41, I, uh, I took a teaching job over at Harlan, Iowa, uh -huh. and uh, I coached and taught there. And uh, I was only there a year because the war, Pearl Harbor in 41, and so I enlisted in June of 42. Oh, yeah. And um, I was in the service uh, from 42 to 46. And sports and things pretty much ground to a halt then anyway. Yes, that's true. I, I still kept pretty active in, uh, in you, sports when and you were in service. service. Did you? Yes. I know they did have some service teams. Yeah, so I, I saw played on uh, uh, several teams, and uh, uh, we played uh, we played some pretty good teams when I was down in Texas. We played uh, Texas A&M. Uh, yeah. Still playing football? Uh, yes. Yeah. 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 And, uh, well, you see, that's kind of a military school. Yes. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think it was then, and I'm, I'm not sure, but uh, it was... Uh, it was a, a great, uh, uh, great time in the service. Then when I got out of the service, why, uh, I started at the university. Let's uh, take a moment in the last part of this first segment of tape we're doing. When did the family begin? When did Gene and well, the I family was married. Uh, were you married during I college or what? I got married in April and graduated in June. Oh, 1941. Yeah, and oh. so uh, we, um, uh, she, uh, Followed me around in the service as long as I was in the, uh, in the country. What here. part of the service were you in? I was in the Air Force. I see. And uh, so we, she followed me around, but then I was overseas, and they wouldn't let her go. <laughs> and, and so uh, that was. Uh, then we came back. I came back, and then we uh, we got we adopted a couple of girls. And this would be about the mid '40s, then. Well, this would be. Uh, well, actually, we didn't make, uh, adopt it to children until about five years after I got back from service. Oh, I see. So it would be in the early 50s. Well, then when you came back from service, you're out of service, what are you going to do? Well, that was it. Ah. I didn't know. I didn't know. I had several jobs offered and uh, selling insurance and things like that, but I didn't think that's what I wanted. And uh, so I came out to the university, and uh, at that time, President Haynes yeah, was there. Yeah. and. Uh, I think they might have made a job for me. I don't know. <laughs> they, uh, they. Uh, I didn't make a lot of money. I no, remember. No. But uh, so I started out there in, uh, in uh, 1946, and uh, stayed out there. I guess was, 
outlived or not outlived, but uh, I had uh, what seven presidents, seven chancellors yeah. all yeah. the time I was there. So, well, what kind of a job was it? What did it well, include? I was in the uh, phys ed department and uh, assistant coach. So that was the same year that uh, uh, Virgil Elkin started and uh, also Lloyd Cardwell. Oh, yeah. And Cardi was hired as football coach, but we didn't have a football team. It wasn't until a year or so later that we actually had a football team. And uh, so... Uh, Sounds like they're really starting to move in the athletic program a little bit. Right. And Harold Jonk was the other staff member we had. No assistant and coaches and no, things like that, that. That was it. That was it. And uh, we did finally, uh, after Cardwell was there a while, we did have a junior varsity team, and I, uh, I coached that too. We called them uh, the Papooses. But your main intention for coaching was basketball. At that well, time, that was your you were head coach in basketball at first. Uh, I was assistant to Harold John in '46, ah. and then he went. Uh, uh, he resigned to go back to the farm. You know, over in, I think, Hancock, Iowa somewhere. And so then I got the head position. So you came really as an assistant right. to both basketball and football. Right. Any other duties other than sports? Or? No, I, well, I taught uh, head phys ed classes. Oh, yeah. They uh, didn't amount to a whole lot, but that <laughs> particular time we, we uh, threw a ball out and, and uh, we didn't have any major in phys ed or anything like that. Uh, At that, that time when people let's say like yourself and others were going to go or wanted to go into coaching uh, and they had a did they get a teaching field in, in yeah. some other subject usually? yeah uh, you had to have uh, you had to be certified in an academic subject and really the coaching was uh, was uh, incidental well it was they really an extracurricular right. activity that's huh? right that's right they, although I think in many schools they hired you because of your coaching ability, yeah, yeah. not necessarily your teaching ability. But uh, it was, uh, uh, it's not as uh, professional as it is nowadays. Uh, you, you're, I, I think they come out now, a phys ed major and a, a coach, they come out much better prepared because they have these uh, theory courses yeah. that they can take. We had, we had no uh, uh, academic uh, coursework in uh, in athletics at that time. They had none, really? No, no, none at all. But one other question before we move on a little bit. In those days, in the 40s, after the war, was it uh, hard or easy for young men and women like yourself to get jobs? We think of it now in 1982, yeah. in a recession period, that it's tough. Well, what was it like then? I think that uh, I was lucky. I was only in a in fact, uh, I only interviewed for two jobs in my life. One was at Harlan, Iowa, and one was at, uh, uh, at the university. But uh, uh, things were starting to open up after the war. Uh, uh, the programs that had been discontinued in many of the schools were starting. And of course, their enrollment was going up because of the GI Bill. Any idea or remembrance of what the enrollment was like when you came there as a staff member? Oh. I really don't. A couple uh, thousand? I would think day? so. I would think so. The original building, you know, that we had in 38 was yeah. designed for a thousand. Uh -huh. I remember that. And it got to be, uh, uh, it was uh, pretty crowded. Put too small almost the first yeah. year. But of course, you realize everything was in that building. Yeah. They, they had uh, no separate library. The library was there in that building. Uh, the bookstore was in that building. Uh, the, all the labs were in that building. Wasn't and the bookstore down on the first floor first somewhere? Floor, right. Yeah. 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 And uh, so the, uh, it became, the, and the cafeteria was in that building. Everything that. was housed in one, well, one building, and then they began uh, spreading out and getting uh, uh, other buildings. Now, they had 52 acres at that time. I always remember the descriptions of the university having 15, 52 beautiful acres. What else was on that campus other than the main building? Was it all grass, practically? Yeah, and uh, not a very good grade of grass, as <laughs> I remember. It was, uh, there were some corn stalks, and uh, it was uh, pretty primitive. It and, used to uh, be a field. Right, and uh, no trees at all. Uh, in the early pictures that you may see, uh, may have seen of the university, uh, it was uh, bleak. You'd just see the building, and that was it. Uh, they did have sidewalks around the one building, you know, but then they had uh, a couple of uh, these temporary buildings. Oh, started. we were already getting temporaries. Uh, Out think, and back? Are they still there? Yeah. Uh, well, temporary permanent. Okay, now uh, we had uh, a student center <laughs> there. Called the shack? The shack, right. And then um, they had an engineering building. 
that uh, uh, shop building. Uh -huh. And I... Uh, uh, that, that was, was another it. temporary, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that was right. And that was it. That was it, though. Yeah. There was no athletic field, no field house? No, nothing, nothing. Uh, just, uh, uh, it was uh, really... Uh, uh, it did have one feature, though, that, was, that everybody bragged about. It was uh, the only completely air-conditioned building yes. or university mm -hmm. at that time. It was a marvelous building, wasn't it? Oh, it, yes. It must have been an impressive one yeah. for the whole city, this building. It was, uh, it, it has always, and it still was yeah. a beautiful building. Yeah. And uh, I have a lot of fond memories of things that went on in there. Well, let's dig into some of those memories. Let's start with, if you can, Don, with um, either, yeah, as a staff member, which you were now shortly after this building was completed. But actually, going back a little bit, this move was made out to this building while you were still a student, wasn't it? Yes. Were you involved in the moving at all when they did this transition? Was this one summer? What was it? You remember? Well, we came out. I think uh, my memory is not as good as it should be. I, I think we started in the, I think we started in the fall term of 1938, as I remember. Brand new building. Brand spanking new, and uh, it was uh, uh, so much better than what we had. Uh, the facilities that. Uh, uh, the, everybody was uh, thought it was the greatest thing. Yeah, no, there was some opposition, I should say, yeah. in the early stages of some of the, well, I couldn't say neighbors because they weren't very close neighbors, but some of the people uh, that thought that uh, things were going to spring up like yeah. hamburger stands right. and uh, uh, tailor shops, I suppose. So they weren't too like happy that. about the university no. moving out there necessarily. No, but uh, it was sort of out of town, wasn't it? Almost, oh, except for a few yes. big estates. Yeah, it was it. Uh, a lot of people wondered why in the world they would build a university out so far west in the cornfield. That was a bit of long, long foresight, right. wasn't it, to pick a beautiful spot, and still is for that particular spot. Yes. They, uh, it, uh, now they've got about every building. I, I don't believe they can get any more uh, buildings in the space that they have there now, unless they go westward. And yeah. They, well, I guess they have plans to do that. Yeah. Now. Going back to the time when the move was made and so on, uh, did they, as they came out, move the whole lock, stock, and barrel school out there, or did they still continue to use no. some of those buildings out in North 24th in any way? No, they thought it, uh, as I recall, it, it was a clean cut. When they moved, they took uh, everything. Did they sell that property off, do you recall? Uh, I don't know. How did that what happen? The... It was the city's operation, really. Yeah, I, uh, I don't know. The... Uh, uh, they had some um, faculty buildings that were across the street. They were just houses, what they were, and they were the first to go. Uh, I really don't know what the financial arrangements were on that. Of course, now you know what's there. It's a high-rise uh, uh, building for the ages, I yeah, believe, yeah, on 24th I think that's and right. And, of course, uh, Ames, uh, I don't think they really would have to do much knocking to knock that, uh, that science wall down. <laughs> it was pretty well... Uh, deteriorated at that time. So some of the people living there in retirement may be living on their old college campus, actually. Yeah, that's, that, could be. that well, could be. Well, let's come back to the university and to the one building which you really had, along with the shack and the engineering quonset or whatever they call it. You were all housed in that one place. Uh, as you recall it, uh, as students, what sorts of programs were available to the students in those days? Well, there... They're quite limited. Uh, we didn't have. We only had one college at that at first, and that was the College of Liberal Arts, the College of Arts and Science, and they had departments like. Uh, oh yeah. Where as now they have a College of Education, they had a Department yeah. of Education. Within that College of. Yeah, uh, and I was in that department, but I think there were only three faculty members there, as I recall. Okay. Uh, there was uh, Dr. Thompson, uh, who was he was uh, in that uh, with psychology and education very closely lit with education yeah. and uh, uh, they had I think three other people and that was that was the department that was the entire department and uh, so naturally the, uh, the the number of classes that they had uh, your uh, course selection uh, was uh, somewhat was somewhat limited not and, too many electives yeah and uh, another bad point too was that that uh, you would have the same professor teaching a different course, you know. You might have him for uh, four or five courses, you know. And uh, uh, I, uh, I think that uh, there, that had some, uh, that wasn't all good. That wasn't yeah. all good. Yeah, and, it really, we called it a university of Omaha, but it was more like a liberal arts college, right. wasn't it? And then they did mm -hmm. have, uh, 
Dean Helmstetter came as uh, Dean of the College of Applied Arts and Science. Well, that's the second college. That's the second. Then, huh? uh, and they had, that was in... About uh, what time? Did that well, be? gee. Roughly. Uh, maybe uh, 49, 50. Mm -hmm. uh, but, and I could be wrong there. But then I think home economics was also connected with that then. Yes, I and, remember that when yeah. I came. Yeah. But uh, then from then on, they uh, came... Uh, you know, then we had the College of Business, and I really don't know how many colleges they have now, well, fine arts and... Yeah, and urban business and, and business so on, and CPACs and yeah. whatever. Well, then really all of these departments eventually branched into college. There was a Department of Business, I suppose, right. too. That's right. All right. right. Dean Lucas, when he was out there, uh, uh, a lot of people remember him as being the dean of the College of Business Administration. But uh, at one time, he was connected in uh, student affairs. He was a dean of students. Uh, ah, I got uh, what you eventually had. Yes, right. And uh, then from there, he went on to, uh, yeah. although he did, when he was uh, in that administrative job, he also was teaching business and uh, business courses. They, were, they didn't have a lot of professors in business then, uh, Rod Crane and, uh -huh. uh, and uh, maybe four or five. Professors. Well, the departments were really quite yeah. small, and so right. was, of course, was the enrollment, right? But it was good. In a lot of respects, the students uh, seemed to, uh, there seemed to be a, oh, a, a good rapport between the students and the, and the faculty. They, uh, uh, I think when you get too big, then you outgrow this, and yeah. uh, you don't know the students as well as, uh, and, or you don't know your professors as well. And uh, so there are some advantages of, uh, of being small, I think. And uh, you lose some of that when you get too large. Yeah. What, uh, if you can describe it in a general way, at least, what kind of students tended to come to our University of Omaha in those days? Were they poor people that couldn't go somewhere else? So what kind? Well, were think, they uh, for other reasons? What? Re why did people come to our university in those early days? Well, I don't know. I, I think uh, you had a cross section then, as you do now. You had. I know we had some uh, students that came from uh, pretty. Uh, fluent families and uh, drive a car. Parking wasn't a problem then, because uh, uh, no, uh, very few had cars. Did they but, have any parking lots? Well, uh, yeah, but uh, they uh, they weren't kept up very well, and uh, more than one axle was broken in, <laughs> in uh, getting in and out. But I think uh, to get back to the type of students, yeah. you had you had a cross section. You had those students that uh, were undecided what they wanted to do, and you had some of them that. Uh, they had to help support the family and they couldn't go far away and they uh, had to go somewhere where they could uh, 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 afford, mm -hmm. as you say. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but we had then, as we have now, we had those good students and those fair students and the poor students. And uh, uh, it's, uh, I, I can't see that students have changed a lot, although I think nowadays that the students are more involved uh, in what's going on in the policies, and they want to become involved in that. And uh, didn't take much interest in uh, uh, politics and social programs and so on in those early days. No, well, they did a lot of community things, a lot more in the, for community than they do now. Yeah, I, right. I remember like Greek Week and that. They would go out and they would go to an old people's home and they would paint it, you know, and fix it up and clean it up and and service project. There was a lot more of that type of thing. The fraternity but, program was active in those. Oh days? yes, very much so. And uh, uh, we had a we had a good fraternity set, and, I, and I, I'm sure that they do now. But uh, I think that fraternities and have kind of drifted away from the campus now, mm -hmm. and there isn't uh, uh, as much. Uh, well, and maybe this is this is good. There's not as much control uh, of what they're doing mm -hmm. in that, and uh, maybe they're doing a good job. Uh, I, I really don't know. No, uh, excuse me. No, go ahead. Uh, so what you're saying here, Don, as we finish up the second segment of our tape together, is that really, over the years, as you reflect on students, whether it's 1938 or 78 or 82, there really isn't a lot of difference between them. That's right. I think, um, well, I, one thing comes to my memory that I always regret, and it was uh, because of, uh, uh, I think, a certain amount of pressure at that particular time when, and what I'm referring to is that we, 
uh, when we got rid of the uh, Indians, the name, yes. the nickname Indians, yes. and I, I, I think that that was, in my opinion, and I, I felt that way then, and I still feel that way now, that it was a bad, that we made a mistake there. And it was through primarily student pressure uh, from a very, very few students. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, uh, Do you think we overreacted? Uh, we, we did. We did. The administration did, the faculty did, and uh, some of the students, I think, uh, got carried away. And if they had a revote, I'm not too sure it would turn out. But uh, it was, they didn't replace it with anything particularly, uh, in my opinion. And a lot of our tradition went down the drain with mm -hmm. that. And of course, we have Mavericks, and we're, which we're very proud of, and and uh, the athletic team is doing an outstanding job. But uh, as far as the uh, co-curricular activity program, uh, it never did come back. And maybe it, if that's the way throughout the country, maybe it was just, uh, the times mm -hmm. uh, have a lot to mm -hmm. do with it. Don, now we're back on videotape. In the summer of 1982, we visited a bit about the campus, about your early life and your early comings to the University of Omaha campus, and your main intention at the job that you received from President Haynes that day was to be in the athletic program, and as I recall, you were an assistant in football and in basketball. Right. And uh, some of the other names that were a part of that small athletic department in those days yeah. as you began. Okay. Uh, Berger Yalkin was hired as athletic director. He came right as athletic director. He came as, as athletic director and, uh, as I recall, baseball coach. Let's pause with Verge because he's gone from us now as we visit in 82. Uh, did he come, has he been a coach other places, that sort of thing? Yes, he was a high school coach in, um, at Fremont, and uh, I believe he had some coaching experience in Lincoln. Uh -huh. But uh, I think uh, he came directly to us from, uh, well, he came directly to us, I think, from the service. Uh -huh. But prior to that, he was uh, coaching high school coaching. I see. And then uh, Lloyd Cardwell, which yeah. we all know, uh, he came as hired as a football coach. And uh, then uh, I think the following year, they hired assistant coach, uh, uh, who was a famous football player at uh, uh, at Nebraska and went on to play professional ball, uh, Charlie Brock. Oh, yes. I used to hear about him on the radio in the great games against Minnesota. Yeah, right. He days. was a center down there, yes. and he coached the line here. He was a wonderful coach. And uh, uh, Now, that's the first expansion is a couple of coaches almost, that's right. huh? That's all right. And then uh, the uh, next addition would uh, be Ernie Gore, who oh, yeah. came from high school, high school over at uh, Nebraska City. What did Ernie come to do? Uh, he came as assistant coach, and uh, he was involved in track, but not as a head coach. Was he, didn't he still live in Nebraska City, though? He lived in Nebraska City, and uh, uh, believe it or not, uh, he would hop on a bus and commute from uh, uh, Nebraska City to Omaha. Uh, and I don't know how long he did that. Um, quite a spell, quite a while, right? yeah, and uh, then uh, he moved in, he moved into Omaha. Now, the sports that you were primarily involved with, though, were basketball and football. That's right. All right, I, uh, we finally, uh, we had a, um, a pretty good turnout for football, and so it was decided to, uh, since we had a large enough squad, we'd have a junior varsity team. And oh. uh, so uh, I was uh, appointed a junior varsity coach. When and did we this begin, 47 or so? Well, no, it must have been 40, uh, 49, I uh -huh. believe, around uh -huh. 49. And we used to play junior colleges uh, around. What's and, what are some of the schools you played? Oh, Fairbury Junior College, and we played uh, uh, Concordia College. Out of Seward? And, yeah, and Dana College. and. Uh, uh, we had, I think, four or five games on the on the schedule, and uh, we had some good ball players. That's quite a bit of an extension yeah. to be able to have a junior right. varsity team. Right. Was the game changing from when you played it very much yet? Oh, very much so. Uh, we uh, uh, then they ran from the single wing, you know. All and, single uh, wing. Huh? Uh, you knew what they were going to do, but you couldn't do much about it a lot of times. But then they developed passing pattern off of a single wing, which gave it quite a bit of deception. Passing wasn't much part of the game, was it? 
Well, is until uh, about now. Yeah, it was nothing like it is now. Well, it's, wasn't one of the reasons for that the shape of the football? That's right. The shape of the football was uh, or kind of around. Yeah. And uh, that's one reason. A lot of times they had what they called drop kicks. Oh, I was, nobody, I was just thinking about that. Nobody ever drop kicks anymore. Describe but, that because I've met a lot of people who might well, watch this tape don't even know what that is. Uh, that was just like uh, kicking a field goal. Only one guy would do it. The ball would be centered from the uh, the ball would come to you from the center. He would get it and drop it and at the same time kick it. And we had some people that could drop that, uh, drop kick that thing 40 yards. It was long. really an art, wasn't it? And a lot of times extra points were done by the drop kicking method. And uh, you didn't have to worry about a person fumbling it, no, uh, no. setting it up, he and held it One guy handled it all the time. And, uh, but it, uh, it, I don't even know if uh, anybody drop kicks anymore. Uh, well, the shape of the football yeah, would make would, it difficult, would, I suppose. It's it would, really a smaller bounce, ball, isn't it? Yeah, it would bounce, I think, oddly, and, and uh, you wouldn't uh, get the control that you had on it. But, and you mentioned uh, the junior varsity there, and the four or five junior colleges, and Dan and so on that you played. This means the program was expanding a little bit. Yes. We had, uh, I think most people remember Joe Arenas now. Oh, he was yeah. going to play on the junior varsity, and about... Uh, you know, Joe never played high school football. Is that right? Never played. He was a good basketball player, and uh, uh, but he never played uh, football in high school. And so he was working out with the junior varsity. We were running the scout plays, you know, for the, against the varsity for the team. You know, we ran the plays of the team that they were going to play. And Joe did so well that uh, uh, Cardi moved him up on the varsity, <laughs> and uh, he, I, he never uh, he never played junior varsity. But uh, and he turned out to be quite a quite a a ball he player. The pro ball yeah, he thought. played with the San Francisco 49ers. Yeah, and yeah. I believe he's still uh, coaching uh, part-time, anyway, down at uh, University of Houston. Oh, is that right? Yeah. But we had, uh, we had some good, uh, pretty good uh, ball players. Uh, we had uh, Fred Pasali, as I remember, who was a coach, uh, uh, teacher at Benson. He was on the junior varsity. He was an outstanding tennis player, probably the outstanding tennis player uh, in the city at that time. Mm -hmm. Oh, say, I forgot to tell you that I also was appointed tennis coach, and I didn't know anything about tennis. But I was... They uh, needed a body, huh? I uh, stand on my record. My record's the best uh, of any that they ever had out of the university. Right? It wasn't because of me. It was the players. And we, uh, uh, I think like Fred, huh? we only lost one match, I believe. And uh, we played teams like uh, Kansas and Iowa State and Nebraska. And wow, you must have a squad. Well, we had a good... Uh, I was kind of the business manager. <laughs> I didn't know anything about uh, tennis. That was something to but, occupy your time in the spring yeah. a little bit, and they needed help there. But I didn't get paid for it uh, either. So, uh, But anyway, it was just one of those things in addition to your other duties. Was that about the time they started intercollegiate tennis? Yeah, that was uh, when it was uh, uh, in the embryonic stage. Late 40s so, then, really. Yeah. So the well, sports we, program was well, really getting a little bigger, really. We had, um, we had uh, some... Uh, tennis before that, but it didn't mount anything. Mm -hmm. But uh, then to get a schedule, but tennis is a, a money loser, you know. Yeah. You don't make any money on tennis because uh, mm -hmm. you, uh, you know, it's uh, you put out for travel and that and meals and you don't get any guarantees right. or anything. It's just kind of a home and home basis. It's sort of like the early days of your football and basketball as a student. The crowds were small. That's right. Or That's non-existent right. almost. Yeah, well yeah. now, the way you, you're inferring, I think by that, if that's so, that uh, in those years when your your coaching staff increased, the student body was getting a little bigger, that sort of thing, the program was on the upswing. Did that mean that uh, sports like basketball and football were drawing bigger crowds and taking in a little money? Yeah, we we began to make uh, we began to make a little money, and uh, like to say we played uh, Iowa University, and we made enough money on that trip to buy uniforms. You know, uh, you didn't have special uniforms at all. Well, we had, uh, the uniforms we had were uh, left much to be desired. So we equipped ourselves with uh, uh, with new uniforms, and uh, it was a, uh, uh, that was when we started to make a little money uh -huh. on, on guarantees and that. Now, you mentioned Iowa University. It, was that at the time, had you moved now into the head of basketball? Yes. All right. What that, year was that? That was 1948. In fact, that was my first game, my uh -huh. first varsity game. What a way to start. Yeah. And uh, they, uh, they, I think that we, um, at the half, they were only about two points ahead. What but, kind of scores did we have in those days? Well, they were small. They were low. I think the final... Jumped ball a lot, didn't you? Oh, yes. They bring that ball back, you know. Uh -huh. And uh, 
they, uh, I, uh, I, I think they had a, a little guy over there named Ware uh, who was playing at that I time. I remember he the was name. American, I believe. Yes. But I think we were unethical in one respect. We used a zone defense, and the Big Ten, I think they had a gentleman's agreement. They weren't supposed to use the, the <laughs> zone defense, and so the 10 points, I believe, is all. Well, which was that, pretty good. That for, didn't do anything for, to hurt your program no, here, did it? No. No, what didn't. was the attraction for an athlete to come and play with us and with you? Because there was little or no scholarship help, was there? No, I think it was uh, primarily love of the game. Mm -hmm. It really was. And that they they uh, had played, you know, in high school. And those things are kind of uh, tages. You, when you once play, you, you get the feeling and uh, you, you continue. But uh, the recruitment was, it was difficult to recruit players, you know, because uh, if the other school offered them much of anything, why, uh, you know, you were uh, uh, second line. And were lots of the schools you were playing starting well, getting into were helping now? Recruitment, yeah, at that uh, they they started to get into the to uh, the uh, uh, they weren't controlled quite as much by the uh, conferences. I was NCAA. wondering about the control. They could do no. about anything they wanted to. Yeah, right? they had a lot of uh, alumni support, you know, and uh, and it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't uh, really uh, moderated too much, you know. They could, they're on their own. You know, I think one thing we ought to pause and do, Don, we can watch a lot of basketball on television today, pro basketball, which gets into the hundreds and then some in scoring, and we can watch a lot of college and even high school tournaments and women's basketball. Well, the game you started to describe, the rules when you started to coach were really different, and I people think it'd be kind of interesting to tell one of the reasons, at least, why the scores were like yeah. 20 to 15 and 30 to 20 and things like that. Yeah. Go through the rules a little. I think that's very interesting. Well, I think one thing, uh, in those days, uh, there was more of an emphasis on defense and offense, you know, if you could keep the team from scoring. And uh, there have uh, been times, and even down at the state tournament, uh, where the scores were, uh, you know, like 6 to 8 or something yes, like that. that. Right. But it wasn't very interesting to the spectators no. because... Uh, now you have to bring that ball up, you know, within a certain time or up to the, uh, middle, of mid, the middle of the court or else it's uh, the, it turned over the other team. And now a lot of their debate now whether they should have the ruling where after a certain number of seconds you have to shoot, you know. Mm -hmm. So the change has been from defense to uh, uh, to offense. Weren't and, you doing a lot of jump balls too? Oh, yes. Uh, at first there, after every basket, uh, when uh, of course this was in the late 30s, so after every basket, uh, they brought it back for a center jump. You oh, know? Wow, and that's, that's not too time uh, consuming. Yeah, that's not too entertaining to the crowd though. So I think everything now is uh, geared toward uh, uh, putting that ball in the hoop. And uh, that's what the crowd wants to see. They, they want to see that. They don't. Uh, I don't think they appreciate, uh, well, they appreciate good defensive plays on the board and that, yeah. but not, uh, uh, not a stalling type of a thing, you know. Well, you, are you suggesting, Don, I think you are, that really most of the rule changes that have come about have been for encouraging fan support? I think. Not I, for the players, necessarily. This is my, in my opinion, you know, to make it interesting, make it exciting for the fans. Football to the uh, mm -hmm. razzle dazzles, the passes, the T formation type thing. Uh, mm -hmm. All this is, uh, uh, in my day, why we used to, well, we would kick sometimes on the second and third down and. Uh, it was defense and football, oh, too, yeah, was you Waiting for the breaks and that. They don't do that now. And we never thought of running the ball from our two yard line. We'd all had heart attacks if, <laughs> if uh, some of the quarterback would have called a play, a running play or a pass play from way back in your deep uh, yeah. end zone, you know. So it was, uh, it's a different style, and it's more entertaining. I have to admit that uh, the stands, they like to be entertained, and uh, scoring is uh, what they would come to see. Now, the basketball team, as you had it in, in the 40s there, involved probably 10, 12 young men, right? Yeah, we, uh, we used to have a, a, a carry a, a squad of 12. Mm -hmm. and, uh, what was the lineup of schools for the varsity? Uh, what did you, who did you play in those? Well, we were not in the North Central then. No. Uh, we were in any conference, were we? No, we were freelancing then, but we played some pretty good teams. We played, uh, oh, Bradley University and uh, Utah, and we played uh, some smaller schools like uh, Peru and Nebraska Wesleyan and... Uh, 
I think we even played a little school. I think it's still going, Tar Hill and that. Mm -hmm. But we would go on a trip. We played DePaul and Brad. And uh, in fact, uh, we beat uh, DePaul University in 1940, I guess it was. And uh, the year before that, they'd been in the garden. And uh, it, we were fortunate, lucky, yeah. I suppose yeah. you'd say. But we put on a uh, uh, pretty, uh, pretty good brand of ball. Now, were all the young men on the team from Omaha almost? Yeah, in those days? I would say 75% of, uh, of our players uh, would, uh, were from uh, Omaha, and the others were from uh, over in Iowa, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. No great distance. But uh, all these young men were really here because they wanted to go to school, and this was a, really an extracurricular activity, yeah. wasn't it? We, uh, we lost uh, more, I think we, we probably lost more students, though, by scholastically than they do now. Oh, is that any reason why well, that might happen? Uh, I don't know. We, we never had tutors, for one thing, like yeah. they do now, and uh, we didn't have the selection of courses that you have. You had to take uh, so much uh, uh, math, so much science. A foreign language. Right. In fact, you had to... Uh, when I, when I was a student, now I'm talking about, when I was a, uh, you had to pass a foreign language proficiency test in addition to an English Ooh. proficiency. And so we lost, uh, we lost some of our ball players because they, uh, uh, they, they went by the scholastic, uh, uh, hit, the, hit the trail by uh, not making the grades. And that really hurt all Yeah, that. right. When you don't have that many to begin with. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Some of the... Some of the names that come to mind as you remember your days of coaching basketball. Some of the standout boys that really did well for you and for the university. Oh, I, don't, I, I would have to say Joe Arenas was an outstanding ball player. Don Clawson was an mm -hmm. outstanding ball player. Any relation mm -hmm. to our current athletic no. director, Connie? Or uh, women's no, of athletic? No, no, but he has a son. I don't know if that's his son that's an outstanding ball player or not. The one that went to Benson. Oh, I'm yeah. not sure about that. Uh -huh. uh, but. Uh, then uh, we had uh, also uh, Bob Mackey, who you probably have heard of. Him. Yes, indeed. He uh, he was a, a good ball player, a good ball handler, and I think he still has the the uh, record for free throws in a single game or Is a single right? season. Yes. How many? You remember? Well, Bob? I don't recall, but uh, I, as I recall that record book, I uh, that's one of the that records right? that's still still intact. But uh, I uh, I I can't think of right now of who. Uh, well, you've Don mentioned Flecky some good names. Was a good oh, man. Yeah. Uh -huh. But uh, we did have, uh, we put on a, we showed up for all the games and put on a pretty <laughs> good, pretty good uh, game for them. We're running out of tape, so we'll need to pause again, and we'll reload and come back and visit some more here on Reflections in Time with Don Plaster. A few moments ago when we changed tapes, we're back at it and reviewing the summer of 1982, and I'm visiting on this fourth videotape with Don Flaster who's just recently retired from our University of Nebraska at Omaha. We've been talking for the last 50 minutes or so, not about the University of Omaha at all, but the school which really preceded it, where he spent much of his life as a student, and then later as a staff and a faculty member. Well, Don, we've been talking for a good part of our time when we relate to the University of your life as a coach. Uh, one thing or so before we leave that, as you look back on basketball, football, your assistantships, and your head coaching time at the University of Omaha in the 40s there, what perhaps, if you can remember, it was the most satisfying moment, the thing you enjoyed the most, the thing gave you a feeling of satisfaction and accomplishment as related to coaching? What did you like about coaching? Let's put it that way. Oh, I don't know. I think it's uh, just the... Uh, we, we had such a, a wonderful rapport between the players and the coaches then, you know. It was fun. Uh, there wasn't so much pressure uh, to, maybe there wasn't as much pressure to win, although we liked to win, yeah. we played to win, yeah. uh, but uh, uh, they were, they were uh, not, outstanding uh, individuals and, and fun to be around, and uh, we, uh, we had fun in practice, and we had fun on trips, and uh, uh, it was just the, the informal uh, relationship that uh, we had, I suppose you get that in, uh, in a classroom, it's not quite possible to get that, I don't believe. Uh, uh, I, I look back on it, and some of the players that I had, I still see, and we still talk about the, the good old days, so I guess they must have been. 
I think there's been a suggestion underlying what you've been saying as you went along. You emphasized here just a moment ago, sports were fun. That's right. Uh, let's take one shot at that, one more shot at that sports area before we leave it. Sports that you've suggested this too have changed a lot. What's changed them? The players, are they different? Are the relationship with the schools and the clubs different now? Is it not as much fun, do you think? I think, uh, I think there's more pressure put on there's more pressure put on the players and uh, more push for winning. I think so, uh, and uh, uh, it's uh, of course that a lot of them they they want to go ahead and continue it into the pros, yeah. and uh, it's day, they it's didn't a do business. That. They, no, we had very few uh, very few students that uh, or very few players that went that way. Mm -hmm. uh, Although I think some of them uh, were uh, had the capabilities of doing so, but now I think it's more of a business. It's uh, uh, everything is uh, uh, more cut and dried. Uh -huh. uh, there's uh, pressure to win and uh, pressure on the coaches, uh, uh, and it's uh, it's it just kind of seeps down. I think to the uh -huh. players. Well, there came a time in your life when the decision was made to do something else. You would coached and you would played for many, many years before the war in high school up at North, back at the University of Omaha, and you came back after being at Harlan and then started up coaching, assisting, right. and head coaching. But uh, there were those were a lot of years, and most of them fairly happy. Why did you change? Well, I uh, I thought about it a long time and uh, made the decision. And that, after I made the decision, I wasn't sure it was the right decision, but uh, I uh, I thought I would give it a give it a try and figure mm -hmm. I could always go back to it. But after I got into administration, uh, I liked it, and uh, I had the uh, privilege of working with outstanding people yes, in that yes. area. I had uh, I in 1952 is when I made my move. And from, you moved uh, to what? I moved as well. We call them dean of men then. Uh -huh. They're no longer called dean of men. No. But we also had a dean of students, and uh, oh, that wow. was. Uh, uh, Dr. McGregor, uh, J. B. Well. J. Great B. Time. McGregor, he was yeah. a great man, and uh, we worked together uh, until his retirement. I think he was there about eight years, and he promoted me from uh, an assistant to associate and that, and uh, uh, I enjoyed, uh, I think I enjoyed the work with him so much that uh, uh, that was the one reason that I stayed. He, he helped make that. the job. Right, and uh, he made the change. Uh, a lot easier for me. That and is quite a change, though, to leave the court and the field, isn't it? Yeah, it, and I missed it at first, uh, but I continued to do some officiating, refereeing, and that, keeping some, some contact with the sport, and uh, uh, so I didn't cut myself off completely. And of course, I was quite a fan then. I, yeah. I don't think I missed many games in those at that time. I attended uh, everything and used to go out and watch them practices and things like that. But uh, I never regret the change that I made to get in administration. And well, it yeah. was enjoyable. We, it was frustrating, but at times, but every job is. Well, when we talk about a dean of men at the University of Omaha, we, we could draw a question mark over that. We didn't have dormitories. No. We didn't have this. We didn't have that. But we had some leadership and the rulemaking organization really for the students. So. What did a dean of men do in those days? What, were, what was well, your job? Well, they were uh, uh, they were deeply involved in the uh, in the uh, uh, the uh, activity program, the student activity program. What was the activity program like? Oh, they uh, it was uh, they had their their holidays, their festive times. They had their uh, dinner dances. They had their uh, student council affairs and the interfraternity council and Panhellenic and uh, the fraternities and sororities were going strong. Now. They were very strong. They were very strong then and uh, uh, had uh, really good recognition too. I recall that we went to a national convention and two years in a row and we got uh, the top award for interfraternity council, uh, and which was. Uh, Pretty good to come from a small school, yeah. And that was judged on things that had been done during the year and that program. You, you that mentioned earlier about uh, community assistance that yeah. they were big on that. <coughs> Excuse me. What were some of the things well, they, that these uh, groups started to get involved with? They were very active in things like uh, cancer drives or heart fund drives or uh, uh, 
health week thing projects and health in the city you know on cleanup days and that type of thing uh, uh, which I don't believe I think there are groups that do that but I don't necessarily think it's university mm -hmm. groups that do that and of course we had uh, the Dean of Men had the discipline and uh, that was uh, not uh, we didn't have a lot of problems well we didn't have dormitories yeah. what kind of problems did you face from time to time what were some of the problems that you oh you would always have uh, the things like uh, if classroom activities of you know cheating and uh, of course you always have drinking problems and uh, they would relate to parties that were that's right I don't know how many times we've had those dogs, those uh, ceramic dogs that are over in Council Bluffs from that RCA building. I don't know how many times we've had those on the front stoops out there at the university. But then they had, that's what I call clean fun. Yeah. That's all right. Yeah. We call them up and tell them to come get them. And, and, uh, but we, uh, we had a bunch. I think our rules were a little more strict then. Yeah. Uh, what are we, some of the strict rules you recall? Well, sponsorship, you know. Uh, uh, if they had an event, why we felt that we had to have somebody there and the person with the faculty of that as a chaperone or, mm -hmm. or whatever you want to call them. And I, I think we overdid that, really. Uh, and Were most of the functions held on campus in those days? No, uh, well, campus and hotels. A lot, of, a lot of the things were. But they would, uh, you know, they, I, I, you know, my first uh, sponsorships, they were... They always put a flower on you, you know, and I always thought that was a way of, you know, presenting you with something, but that was just a badge of, you know, who to let watch out. Identify. Yeah, identify you, <laughs> and they put you in a room somewhere and bring you those Cokes, and, and uh, but we, we had very few problems, very few problems uh, uh, in regard to discipline, uh, but uh, we had dress codes and things like that. Which, what was the dress code? Oh, nowadays? they were, uh, they were, uh, as I looked at them now, they were pretty stupid. Uh, what sorts of things? Oh, like uh, they wouldn't let you go in the library with slacks on, for instance. You couldn't, women couldn't wear slacks in the library. And I recall this one gal, so she went in the restroom and took her slacks off. She had a raincoat on. And so she just took her slacks off. And I'm not sure that's any better. <laughs> but uh, we did. Uh, I think that was one of the positive things uh, of the, that the students, through their committees, uh, got rid of uh, a, a dre that dress code and that. It's when did student government, as such as we have it now on our campus and most campuses, when did that really get rolling? Well, it was really, uh, I would say, uh, in the 70s, when they got active, uh, I would say in 65, around in there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and. Uh, they wanted to be on all committees, you know. And uh, sometimes this was good, sometimes it was bad. I remember we had a committee, a uh, 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 student center policy committee of students. And uh, it was all they wanted to do is, uh, you know, heckle the faculty in this administration mm -hmm. a little bit. It got to such a stage that they were trying to tell us how much pepper to put in the, the food, you know in the cafeteria and stuff. It was, uh, got pretty ass nine. <laughs> but uh, by and large, those committees uh, that had students on represented, uh, that they, they were pretty uh, thoughtful and, and uh, uh, used good judgment. A few, few radicals, you always have them, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, are uh, just trying to stir things up, you know. But this was, this was uh, the way of life uh, during those times on all campuses. Yeah. We had very few problems. We and had. You're talking about the '60s now, pretty much, aren't right? We? Yeah. We had we had one sit-in one time, but uh, we there was nobody uh, ever hurt, or we had no really vandalism or anything. Yeah. Uh, but it was a, it was a time of adjustment for all for all universities. But as a dean of men and involved in student policy and so on, you did have some problems. Yeah. Well, it just got to be uh, where we thought, well, maybe the rule isn't right, but until it changed, you know, you got to stick by it. You know, you just can't give up everything. And uh, I think this is where we ran in the, this interchanging of, of, uh, of uh, redoing some of the things. Uh, there was some... Uh, like the nickname. Yeah. There were some things that... I think there was more positive, more good came out of it than bad, but there... Uh, there were some things, I think, that uh, we, uh, some mistakes that we made. 
Did you like being Dean of Men? Oh, I, I enjoyed it very much. And then when Dean McGregor retired, why I was, uh, Dr. Bale was uh, president at that particular time, and uh, he uh, gave me a try at it, and I was, then I was Dean of Students for About, about what year was that, Don? 1960. Uh -huh. Well, then you really became the head of all student activity yeah. during that very turbulent period. Yeah. Yeah, we... Uh, what are I, some of the things you remember that stand out in those years? Or people or things or happenings? You mentioned the sit-in, I know, but... Yeah. Were things starting to change? Were students starting to really flex their muscle a little now? Yeah, they wanted to be uh, heard. And uh, uh, the student senate probably changed as more than, um, than any other uh, governing oh, body. Oh, so? yeah, yeah, they changed to where... Uh, well, they even... Uh, Chains where they got paid, you know, yes. and uh, uh, things like that. And some people, some administrators uh, reacted unfavorably against that. But they did put a lot of time in. And uh, uh, as you know, I guess they're still sitting on the Board of Regents. Yes. Uh, uh, and that was, a, that was a thing that uh, I don't know if they have a vote or not. I don't believe they have a vote. Mm -hmm. They have a say, you know. Mm -hmm. and. and uh, to, to listen to. Do you think that's good? Do you like that? As you I look think, at the uh, changing scene? Yeah, I, uh, I, I think uh, on the equation there's more pluses and minuses on Do it. Do you think college life generally helps a young man or woman in the best sense to grow up a little? Oh, I'm sure of that. I'm sure of that. There are some, there are some students that adjust more readily to their freedom than others and uh, they handle it much better. Now, after you left the, your job as dean of students, things changed at the university, didn't they? Now we're moving into the merger and things yeah. like that. What do you remember about the merger, Don? Well, there was some decision. There was some uh, question, I think, in a lot of people, the old timers' minds, if it was the right move. You know, they thought that they were losing a lot of their uh, full personal touch with the. Uh, that they were just going to be shoved aside yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. uh, dictated to by whom, I'm not sure. But uh, there's no doubt that the merger had uh, a plus effects on the, on the university. Were you unhappy about it at first yourself? Uh, no, I really uh, had no strong feelings one way or the other. I, uh, uh, I, uh, I, th I could say that we, if we were going to do some things, while well, we had to have money in order to get the money, we could not do it the way we were doing it. We were getting tight on money, weren't we? Right. You see, we couldn't even build a building unless you had the money yeah. before. You had to save, and, and then uh, the only reason that we got the student center was because uh, Eugene Epley came out and, uh, after the library was completed and gave a check for, what, 750000 and. So he bought the library, so to speak, and that gave us money to buy another building. Yeah. So uh, the merger en enabled us uh, financially uh, to uh, do more things, uh, building-wise and faculty-wise. Uh, uh, so I think that uh, you lost, uh, you probably, when you get large, though, you, there's, uh, you lose a lot of the togetherness or the uh, uh, daily rapport that you would have with one another. You see each other at a meeting, and even now the departments are so much bigger than even the colleges were then, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. that I'm not sure that everybody knows what's going on. I think the line of communication breaks down and uh, uh, somewhere and uh, doesn't filter down to everybody and uh, you uh, you're not a part of it you're not you're apart from it and uh, you have to read about it in the paper to find out what's going on maybe even in your own mm -hmm. little or in your own bailiwick you know I think that that's a bad part of it well, we want to keep going for a bit longer Don and talk about some of the years that you've had at the university in the period when I suppose it really expanded as much as it ever had, just grew by leaps and bounds. You mentioned a moment ago on the last tape uh, that uh, the merger turned out to be a good thing in terms of paying the bills and the growth of the university and things like that. Before we do that, I think we ought to pause. We're sitting here in the summer of 1982 in Don's Blaster's beautiful backyard where he and Jean live. And uh, if you've heard some noises in the background as we record this, it just points up the time of year. It's about halfway over. It's almost July 4th. 
and occasionally you'll hear a firecracker, and it's not that they, they're trying to bomb us out or anything. Don, oh. Don, um, uh, you were coach of basketball, and then you were the dean of students after being dean of men. Now what, what was the year and what happened next? Well, uh, we had a change uh, when uh, Chancellor President Roskins came, and uh, they kind of redid the uh, student affairs office yes. uh, and also some other offices, counseling and testing and that. And uh, they uh, came in with a vice chancellor for student affairs, I guess. Do they call him that? Or vice chancellor for... I'm not sure that's not the right word that they gave him. And uh, I, I remained on there, but uh, my name or my title was changed to a coordinator for student development. I'm Let's not see. sure what that meant. But yeah, I was going to ask you what that meant. But I think uh, I seemed I was doing the same thing. But uh, there was a vice chancellor that came on the scene that essentially was doing what you'd been doing. Yes. As dean of student right. personnel, well, right? Right. The dean of students, you know, he uh, was over such things as the placement office, the registrar's office, the counseling, testing, and admissions, and and student health, and that type of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, that did not change uh, uh, as far as the areas of responsibility was concerned, yeah. except that they broke it up, and uh, uh, he really had more people helping him do the job. Yeah. You were. You had little or no staff other than the secretary, did you? No, that's about right. Uh, and we had, uh, but we we had um, uh, meetings uh, with. Uh, my, like, there was a coordinator of student development, which I was. That's you. Uh, and then there was a coordinator, uh, Dr. Olson, uh, special service or whatever mm -hmm. the title they gave him. And uh, then there was a coordinator for minority affairs. Yeah. And uh, we were. And then uh, we had a director of the student center. Now we were the ones that were, would meet with uh, Vice Chancellor yeah, Beer. Yeah. And, uh, and at one uh, time I was involved with some of you too with the radio and television. That's that right. That Th too. That's right. And there seems to be uh, there's somebody Audio else visual. in there. Audiovisual. Audiovisual. Uh, Ron Pullen. Right. Was in that. Right. And right. Uh, these were the areas that uh, were still in business. And uh, uh, but. Uh, uh, they were uh, kind of segregated in some respect of, of uh, uh, they're still responsible to the vice chancellor. Uh, duties, I guess, didn't change really that much. So though. you were still doing yeah. many of the things you'd done before and relating right. to students, right? That's right. Okay, how many years did this uh, well, uh, last, uh, Don? This goes... Now, this, now we're after the merger and we're getting into yeah. the 70s, right? Right, and I'm not so sure when, uh, how long I was uh, as coordinator, and then I was a, uh, Don Skahin and I kind of changed jobs. Yeah. Uh, I went over to the student center uh, as the director of student center and still coordinator for student development, and was there for a while, and then- Running the student center too? Running the student center, and then coming, and then I came back, uh, Oh, no, this is when we changed jobs. Skahan was the assistant to the uh, vice chancellor, uh -huh. and he came over to the student center, and then I went over t as uh, Dr. Uh, Bayer's assistant. I see. And uh, then I remained there. I had, uh, I knew that I was, or I had hoped that I could retire when I was 62. Uh, mm -hmm. That was my plans originally. Mm -hmm. And so as that time approached, uh, there was a job as uh, the, uh, what do we want to call him? The right? ombudsman. I never it's a word that's I'd always hard to it. say. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I um, applied for that job and was selected for that. And uh, the uh, last two and a half years or so, I uh, was the university ombudsman. And that person is really involved with students' personal problems, right? Well, not only students, but staff and faculty. Yeah, anybody. Yeah, that has it's a, a very interesting job, but. Uh, you don't see many happy peepee no. people because they all come there with a, a gripe. That's what why they're there. What sort of gripes are they coming with, or were they coming with? Well, most of the students were because of something, classroom thing, uh, grades. grades. They thought they were being uh, dealt with unfairly, or something the professor does, did or didn't do that they thought he should have, and and uh, things like that. Staff was mainly, oh, they're 
maybe their hours had been changed or mm -hmm. they were having trouble with their supervisor and uh, faculty it was mainly on promotion and tenure and and uh, that type of thing but you see the uh, there was one good thing about the ombudsman you were not well you were responsible to the chancellor and uh, you didn't have a boss otherwise uh, you're independent and uh, you could uh, 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 not that they respected me greatly, but they respected the position, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, you got uh, pretty speedy action on things. Oh, I'm quite what sure they respected you too, Donald. Go ahead. Well, what we try to do is solve it, uh, if we could, uh, uh, without going into uh, the formal grievance uh, yeah. committees and that. And we tried to help solve the problems. Yeah, we were yeah. we were pretty successful. I think we we had uh, some of them that went the full route, but. Uh, by and large, it was uh, uh, it was it was an interesting job. I enjoyed it, but uh, it's a type of a job uh, you wouldn't want to do for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Though it's uh, it's kind of a, a burning out burnout job, and uh, it's uh, it's it was it was frustrating at times. When we talk about the rest of your life, let's come back to that and talk a little about retirement. But before we do that, you've been with the university one way or another since the 30s, really. Uh, and uh, people have come and gone, lived and died. There have been friends, colleagues, co-workers, bosses. Uh, there are so many, we don't expect that you can name them all. I don't, we don't necessarily have the time for that, of course. But there were so many people. You mentioned Dean McGregor that was so influential in your life and important to you. And I imagine there are a number of other people that stand out, thinking not only of yourself, but of the university and its growth and change. And if you're going to pick uh, sort of an all-American team of mm -hmm. Uh, related to our University of Omaha and University of Nebraska, Omaha. Who were some of the people and why uh, they related to you and to our university that were really important? Well, I would say that uh, uh, this takes back to student days and also when I was out there as an employee, uh, that uh, one of the most outstanding professors, uh, in my opinion, was uh, Dr. Leslie Garlow who was in biology. He oh, was yes. well thought of, well known, yeah, yeah. well respected, and uh, uh, another person uh, that uh, we have all heard of and known sometime. In fact, he's still teaching. Uh, he's retired twice, once from the university and once from Creighton, uh, uh, Dr. Wardle yes. in, in English. He would have to be uh, one of the great people. Uh, Dr. Nell Ward, who was a uh, uh, I remember her at the old building that I was telling you about, uh, about the North, uh, North 24th, teaching chemistry. She was an outstanding person. And uh, uh, Dr. James uh, uh, Earl, uh, Jim Dr. Earl, Earl yeah. Jim Earl, uh, in mathematics, uh, he was, uh, he was a, a good person, outstanding person. He outstanding. had a lot to do with the growth and change of departments in the university, too, that's, didn't he, in terms right. of the life of the university. And yeah. you couldn't uh, help, you have to mention Dr. Wilford Payne, everybody that uh, uh, was at the university and remembers him. There were times <laughs> I didn't understand what he was saying, but he said it so wonderfully that uh, <laughs> uh, it didn't really matter. <laughs> but uh, he was uh, he was an outstanding professor in, in the humanities, in philosophy. And of course, we shouldn't, uh, I wouldn't want to forget uh, Dr. Uh, Milo Bale, who was present there for a uh, great number of years and a and, uh, very good friend of mine. Uh, he was, uh, uh, well, I, I don't know how to say this, uh, but he was, he's not difficult to work for, but uh, you sure knew who the boss was. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, we, uh, I, I think that uh, he uh, was very, good for the university at that time. Uh, he may, and he admits this himself, would have maybe a difficult time uh, being a president under the modern day uh, <laughs> philosophies, but uh, uh, he was an outstanding person and uh, uh, a leader in, uh, in education and uh, uh, in higher education, I should say. And I, uh, I've always respected him and, and still do. I think he uh, had a birthday last week. Uh, I don't know, I think maybe 84 years old. Yeah, so, so in 1982, our president, for whom the Student Center has been named well, yeah. 84 years old. Yeah, and uh, those are some of the uh, people that uh, uh, 
whenever I think of the university, I think there are so many of them. Though, How not, about some of the people who worked with you? Oh, we I've always had been fortunate to have a good yes, staff. Yes, you did. I, uh, uh, I would uh, be amiss if I didn't mention uh, Thelma Engel, who yes. was uh, uh, worked as associate uh, director of the student center. She was uh, an outstanding person, did a wonderful job. Uh, old friend Bill Gearbrock, mm -hmm. who uh, I don't know if he's officially given the title of the registrar, but he's been there for 30 some years and he worked for me in, in uh, different uh, uh, capacities. And uh, oh, there are just so, just so many of them that uh, uh, Dr. Gail Olson has been a personal friend for a long time mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and uh, is uh, still out there. He was head of the counseling and guidance. But those, have, those were good years, and uh, although I'm enjoying retirement, uh, uh, I, I still uh, uh, have fond memories of uh, Omaha U and University of Nebraska at Omaha. Well said, Donald. Just a moment before we wind things up. Uh, now we're sitting in this comfortable backyard in the summer of 82 on Old Westover Road, where you've lived with your good wife, Jean, and your daughters for many years. Um, Retirement. Uh, you said a while ago that you kind of wanted to retire when you were 62. Well, uh, you finally got to retire. Is it what you expected? Oh, yes. I, um, I didn't plan to do a lot, and I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I uh, regulate my own schedule, and uh, uh, I'm really not bored. Uh, I don't know. People, they always say, well, what do you do? And I really don't know. I uh, do a little cooking, and do a little housework and do a little work in the yard and and uh, drink a couple beers once in a while. Yeah, and, yeah. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I, uh, I'm enjoying it. Now, you are a great storyteller, and everyone who's known you and would watch this tape will say, when's going to tell one of his stories? Well, you mentioned a couple, but there's one that the producer of this Reflections Time, Tim Fitzgerald, has just reminded me we want you to tell about. Years ago, at least, we were heavily involved at this university in writing annual reports yes. to our president, to our dean, yeah. to whomever. They were sometimes rather voluminous. Right. And there was a time in all of this when you stopped and said, hey, does anybody read this? Yeah. Right? right? All right. Tell us that story. Well, I guess uh, since I've retired and they can't cut off my Social Security or anything, <laughs> uh, yeah, I was probably, I would uh, procrastinate on those annual reports quite a bit and leave it to the last minute. And they, as you say, they, uh, in our, my area, they had to have a lot of stuff in there. And I thought, well, I bet nobody ever reads this thing. So I thought one time I'm going to give it a test and try. So I just inserted somewhere in the middle of it uh, a brownie recipe, <laughs> you know. Uh, I just got it out of the cookbook and put a brownie recipe in there and thinking, well, let's see if anybody reads it. And I haven't heard to this day if anybody's used that brownie recipe. So I have a feeling that uh, maybe that page was skipped anyway. But uh, it was uh, it was kind of fun anyway. It was, it was a good recipe, as I remember. <laughs> well, if you ever run into good brownies, it might be the person with the report in their file. Uh, now, um, as you look back on all these good years together with uh, the rest of us out at the university, and then some, 30, 35, and more years, uh, if you're going to pick one or two or three things that stand out most in your memory in the history of the university or, or your own life, what are the things that come to mind as you think of the old University of Omaha first and then maybe University of Nebraska at Omaha? That's a tough one. Do what well, you can. Yeah, right? I, uh, I don't know. There's no... I think one of uh, the things that I think about, uh, and I really don't miss this, is I was commencement, uh, director of commencement oh, yes. for 25 years. And it never failed that during commencement we would have a problem. And we had some great problems during commencement. Uh, the organ wouldn't play or uh, it might uh, the lights went out, uh, had a power failure. We had one thing that was exceptionally funny is uh, at this particular time we didn't have the entire class come up and get their diploma. We just selected the high one from each college. And this one gal that came up, she must have misunderstood what I said, but instead of coming up the steps, she jumped up right up the platform. <laughs> right in the middle of the platform and almost the, the, it was it was horrible and i told the girl behind her to do the same thing but uh luckily she, she didn't another time in commencement uh we were going out recessional and uh the one of the faculty members was talking to another one he got uh 
confused. He didn't follow the usher, and he followed this group down to the men's room. And everybody behind him was going, following him down. I and think I remember part of that story. Okay, <laughs> that was that was a little confusing. Yes, they were uh, exciting days. Yes, they were, Don. And it's been an exciting morning for us to visit with you. And I want to thank you very much for for letting us come and visit about your reflections on time at the university. We thank Don, and we hope that many of you will enjoy reflecting on the times of the university in this tape that we made in the summer of 1982. Your host has been Paul Borgie.